Yeah, I think we could start. Uh, my name is Karin Malmqvist, and I work as a curator, program curator here at Moderna Museet. And I would like you all, I would like to warmly welcome you all to Moderna Museet and to this symposium about art and technology. Uh, this symposium is partly kind of finissage uh, as it coincides with the last weekend for the exhibition Mud Muses, a rant about technology, curated by my colleague Lars Bang Larsen. Uh, the exhibition presents no less than 19 artists and groups in a time travel via important transformation that the topic art and technology has undergone since all back since the 60s. Uh, from Robert Rauschenberg's Mad Muse to the contemporary Bob by Ian Cheng. And Bob will, as you can see, certainly be the center of attention here today. Uh, before leaving the word uh, over to Isaac Nilsson, Director of Art Initiative and Research Fellow at Stockholm School of Economics, I would like to mention that apart from being this finissage for Mad Muses, this symposium is also a continuation of a very fruitful and exciting collaboration with Art Initiative. So thank you for this. Uh, I will now leave the word to Isaac, and Isaac will introduce the program and also the speakers. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Karen, for uh, the introduction. Uh, my name is Isaac Nilsson. I'm a research fellow at the Stockholm School of Economics and also acting director of the SSE Art Initiative, which is a pedagogical effort for art and humanities at the SSE. And uh, today we have really the pleasure of welcoming you here for this today's event, uh, A Bag of Beliefs, a symposium about art and technology that will, will evolve around uh, Ian Cheng's artistic practice in which artificial intelligence is used to create, one could say, digital life forms, um, very visible in the artwork Bob that you can see in the exhibition uh, Mud Muses up here, um, that evolves around different relations, one could say, about art and technology. And standing in front of you here today as a represent representative from Stockholm School of Economics, one might ask oneself, why is a business school interested in the relation between technology and art, or art and technology? Well, if we start with technology, we see that specifically artificial intelligence, uh, which is a tool that Ian Cheng uses in his artistic practice, is one of the most widely and frequently debated topics within the business discourse and also at society at large. And I would say that it's very rightly so, uh, as the professor Max Tiagmark, a Swedish physicist, has pointed out, uh, AI as a technology can actually have a bigger impact and influence on our world than climate change just within a couple of decades. And compared to, for example, warfare, social injustice, and migration, uh, there's many projections stating that it can actually have a more wider general influence on, how we're on our world, how we relate to ourselves and, and each other. But, however, there are a very vivid uh, debate, one could say, and also controversies on exactly how uh, the influence of AI will materialize in our economies and you know, our judicial systems and our relations to ourselves, ra ranging from what we could call utopian uh, digitalists, uh, such as the co-founder of Google, Larry Page, that in AI sees the promise, one could say, of a fully digital life being the next natural state of uh, the cosmic evolution, over to more skeptic voices, one could say, such as uh, the Swedish philosopher Nick Bostrom, that points out existential risks relating to AI that could potentially, one could say, curtail uh, the potential of humanity as such. So to conclude, one could say that there's certainly a very big bag of beliefs about technology and what it could end up with, and there's a very huge degree of uncertainty in relation to what kind of challenges and opportunities that modern technologies will generate and convey. And at the Stockholm School of Economics, we have actually made it our educational mission to prepare students for this type of uncertainty by giving them an education, uh, which through the words of, of Ingmar Hedenius, a philosopher, uh, makes them free and at ease in relation to the unknown, in relation to the uncertainties that our world are, um, are facing. 
And to be free and at ease, you of course need to be very fact, fact and science minded. But we also see that the future decision makers need to be more reflective, they need to be more empathetic, and they have to also be more entrepreneurial in the sense of, of challenging the status quo on how, how we think about markets, how we think about societal development, and how we think about uh, the uncertainties um, of modern technologies, for example. And this is where the pedagogical aspect of of art becomes crucial to us as an institution. Because uh, from our point of view, we see that our great works of art can really work as a sort of, of itching powder that forces us to reflect on these topics. And that kind of invites us into aesthetic worlds in which we are more free and challenged to reflect on these topics over times. And that is something that I think that Bob, as well as the other works by Ian Cheng, um, really contributes with. It's a state of the art in that sense, uh, which through then, artificial intelligence are posing questions about cognitions and in a broader sense how we as perhaps as humans, human agents, uh, can relate to, and, um, to uh, digital beings in an era of AI. So a few words about Ian Cheng. Ian Cheng is an artist, he's based in New York and has exhibited widely, I would say, around the world, including MoMA PS1, his Venice Biennale, here at Modano Museet, of course, uh, and so forth. And today, Ian Cheng will start by giving a presentation about his artistic practice before he is joined by Veronica So, uh, who is a producer and also the co-parent of Bob and the Emissaries uh, Triology, uh, with whom he will discuss uh, the cognitive architecture of Bob, which will be led and moderated by Lars Bang Larsen, who is the curator of the Mad Muses uh, exhibition. Uh, the symposium will then conclude with a panel from the Stockholm School of Economics where we have two excellent bachelor students, uh, Paula Vega and Claire Holm Schau, who's also engaged in very active in the student organization art uh, division, with whom uh, SSC Art Initiative um, collaborates uh, a lot. And we also have Roberto Verganti, who is a professor of innovation and leadership from Milan, and who we have the pleasure of having at the Stockholm School of Economics right now, focusing on design uh, questions. And we'll also leave some space, uh, time for, 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 for questions and debate from, from you guys in, in the audience. So with these words, I think we're more than eager to, to hear Ian Cheng. So I would like to invite you up to the stage, and it's a pleasure of having you here. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you for having me. I'm super happy to be here, and I'm really proud that Bob can be shown here. Um, I thought I'd walk you through, I guess, a curated part of my hard drive to talk about the process of making Bob, how it all started, and kind of what my goals were in the beginning, how they changed in the end. Um, previous to Bob, I'd been making um, these simulations, kind of think of them as a video game that plays itself, and often they would, they would take the form of large kind of ecosystems with many little characters um, populating the ecosystems whose behaviors would change as the environment would change, as the, they would change each other. And they took on a lot of epic nature, and when it came to doing Bob about two years ago, I really wanted to focus on the scale of a creature, and to think about a creature as a kind of compositional space. And oftentimes, um, a lot of my friends are painters, and they'll say, like, you got to mind the edges. And when I think about a creature as a compositional space, the edges of a creature are its life, and the way in which it's born, the way in which it dies, and the journey it takes in between. And at the same time, I was thinking, of course, a lot about AI, um, and the ways in which um, AI is a very dispersed term, means so many things, and we have so many projections about what it is, and it has so many pragmatic applications right now. Um, but I thought I'd start in a very modest place, which was to think about uh, the AI of a creature, which is not nearly the AI of us as human, uh, excuse me, the intelligence of us as human beings, let alone the question of consciousness. But when I took the question of how could I replicate a creature um, seriously, I had to think a little bit about the question of sentience. And I want to try to grope at maybe what my answer turned out to be, which I didn't think it I didn't think I would find an answer in doing this, but I wanted to know through doing. And so I started Bob with the idea of how could I take the question of sentience really seriously? Could it be, what is it? And could it be replicated um, in the form of an artwork, in the form of AI? Um, so Bob really started from a, a dream. I had this dream that there was this, I was thinking about a creature, I wanted to make a creature, and I had a dream about a snake that would 
kind of fractalize into a tree and the tree would grow as its brain grew. It's almost like if, as if it was a, a snake and a neuron at the same time. And if those things could be combined together, you would have both a condensation of a creature that would outwardly represent, in a way, its cognitive structure, its kind of uh, cognitive architecture. Um, so if you've seen the show, this, you know Bob looks like this right now, and this is what Bob ended up looking like. We'll, we'll get to this right side, which is its uh, a kind of visualization of its brain. Um, but Bob started from this idea of a snake. Um, I don't know if it was going to be a VR project. I was working with Ben Vickers at Serpentine to develop um, an idea maybe for Bob being a VR experience. It turned into uh, this kind of here, this kind of creature that would, hmm, hold on, let's do it this way. Um, this kind of snake, kind of worm guy that would turn into a, a tree, and each node in its tree would be a representation, abstractly, I didn't know yet how to do this, of a belief. I intuited that we needed to go in a much more subjective direction. Um, I should back up and say a lot of uh, my work in working in simulations and making Bob was built in a video game engine called Unity. And Unity, and as well as in programming, uh, take on a very, um, how do I say, materialist position about how you set up the world. Uh, the world has objects, uh, those objects have behaviors, and you yourself as a programmer should understand and know the limits and, uh, of those behaviors because you have to program them. Um, if I was to take the question of sentience really seriously, I thought I had to take a really anti-materialist position in the sense that a sentient creature, whatever that might be, is an interpretive structure on which it sees the world. So it doesn't see the world as objects, I mean, thinking about myself, you see the world in terms of things that you value, things that are tools to your current motivation, things that are obstacles to those motivations, and things that are irrelevant. And in fact, the more I researched about this, the idea that perception, it's, uh, more recent findings that perception itself is highly constrained and filtered down. Your perception is a function of what your current motivation is. So if you're really hungry, you, all you really see is opportunities for food, things that get in the way of those opportunities, and everything else is irrelevant. Um, and so I started to develop a understanding that I had to think about Bob not in terms of a, an objective landscape on which a creature lives and has um, objective opportunities in it, but I, think, I had to think about Bob as a, a creature that has a body from which it determines and feels what is within the realm of things it can expect and know and things that are completely chaotic and unknown. And that is a constantly present category in the life of Bob, and I would say in the life of ourselves as interpretive structures that look upon the world. So I started thinking very subjectively about Bob, and it would mean that if I created an AI for Bob, it would have all the bias and um, bad beliefs, not bad, but like misinformed beliefs um, that it would use to act upon the world, but that if it kept going, its personality would be the achievement of all those um, poorly defined beliefs that got revised and updated over the course of its life. And I thought that would be a pretty good journey for a creature. Um, but just to back up for a sec, I had to start, I realized, with something, right? It's one thing to think about an AI, it's another thing to find a form for it, and I think literally I needed a form to embody it. it need, Bob needed a body in which to experience the world. Um, so I started to develop this snake creature. Um, oh yeah, here. So it evolved eventually into something like this, where I thought Bob could have, its, um, its body could express different states of its personality. This was around mm, late 2017 when I was at this stage. Still had no idea what to do about the AI. Got really into making its body. And um, the culmination of that, oh, Bob was very influenced by otter. I, <laughs> I thought an otter would be a good animal to, I don't know, otters are kind of mean and cute at the same time. Um, you can see, <laughs> here's, here's an evolution of Bob. Um, I want to show you some body videos. Okay, here. Let's look at this. So this is like first Bob trying to get a fractalizing snake just to, just to move in a way that would be, 
I don't know how to say this. It's like almost like a Trojan horse, right? Like the body of Bob, for me, just let alone the viewer, for me would have to be interesting enough to keep my attention to make this creature work, to go through the trouble and the pain of making this creature. Because like art is extremely, it's like really fun, but it's like extremely painful, especially when it comes to these very... Uh, this, the kind of technical side of having to invent sometimes the tools or develop further tools to even make the work. And the journey of Bob was about two and a half years all told and um, with moments of extreme suffering and pain where nothing was working. And I knew in the very beginning from previous projects that Bob had to be, had to move at least in an interesting way to, to, to keep me interested. So we started like very earnestly with trying to get the body down here. Um, it has no intelligence. I'm moving it around. I'm kind of directing its head with my mouse here. Just seeing how, with, a, with such a weird, I mean, I don't know, I make trouble for myself. So with such a weird body, how would that manifest in terms of seeking something? Um, like, really slowly. I. I Thought Bob needed a friend, so I gave him the cow. And um, I, I was thinking a lot about these kind of Tibetan tankas at the time, just in terms of thinking about Bob as a cognitive structure that's also a creature. And uh, my in-laws are um, you know, pra practicing Buddhists, and um, every time they showed me like a Tibetan tanka, they would say, you know, these gods that you see, one of them is like this kind of uh, cow creature character. They're like avatars for very complex ideas. They're almost like ancient Pokemon, so that if you were um, a, a practicing Buddhist many years ago and you were like a kid, you could compact those ideas into the form of these avatars and you would know them. You would know their avatars, so you wouldn't mistake them um, for uh, like characters in themselves, but you would have a portal into these more complex ideas through this um, representation of animals like flora and fauna local to the landscape that they were living in. So I thought, I don't know, I was just, you know, you don't know what you're doing when you're making art. That's why you make it, so. Um, I thought Bob needed a friend to offset what kind of creature it was. We ditched that idea, but it started there. Um, like, would Bob eat this character with the Bob? be friends with it? What, what, what would Bob do with this character? I think this is something I still want to explore, but we jumped the gun here trying to explore it very early. Uh, meanwhile, by the way, Bob has zero intelligence here. But you can start to feel already a kind of optimism about Bob. I mean, just as a kind of video game character, uh, I got very excited when it got to this point where it had some... Uh, how do you say, some semblance or illusion of life in it. I mean, it has, it's making no decisions on its own. Um, but it's at least an avatar that I could invest my time into. Um, expressions for Bob. I intuited that we needed to do this. Uh, Bob needed to um, emote in a way that could suggest its internal state. It's a very obvious thing to say, but... Um, so we devised, we tried to devise a face for Bob that could express as many legible emotions as possible. Okay, so the body, just to say, um, I wanted to suffuse the body with a kind of uh, procedural intelligence. So forget AI for a second. I wanted the body to come alive on its own. Um, the way that you see the way certain plants grow and they have a kind of procedural intelligence. They grow towards certain stimuli. Uh, they grow in relation to each other in the very basic way. Uh, so some very low-level insect behavior, uh, some very low-level bird behavior like flocking. Um, these are very, um, they don't require thinking. They don't require decision-making. Uh, they don't require very much modification of that behavior. They just do. And so we decided to... Uh, make every one of Bob's little nodes or tips kind of have a relationship to each other so they would, they would flock and what that would result in was a kind of procedural or ambient movement um, that could take very different characters. Um, um, 
it can become this kind of dragon-like character you see now, where it's more upright. It could root itself inverted, so it could kind of become like a bonsai tree in a more uh, sedate state. And again, this is all in the service of, I think, optimism for myself and for my team, Veronica, my producer, and the engineers that we work with, that this is something worth working on. I can't stress enough how like, challenging and important that is to like, have these landmarks along the way in the project that make you feel like it's still worth doing. Um, let's skip that one. Again, an optimistic moment where, you know, Bob could, if we got rid of all its um, kind of fractalization, it would still take on an interesting character here, as, as we would instinctively feel. It feels like a snake. Um, it seems sneakier. I think this was... This was about pain. So this is the Bob stress test. So you got a creature that is snake-like, and you want to rip the snake, right? Um, so we wanted to uh, put into Bob's body immediately the ability to sense a kind of virtual pain. So like if it was stretched a very long distance, it'd be the equivalent of stretching yourself, and there would be pain, and there would be a breaking point, and Bob would need to be able to sense this pain. I knew intuitively that we needed that for the AI. I don't know why, I didn't know why at this time, but we did. Um, so we made it so Bob could break. So what else have we got here? Okay, so now I started thinking about Bob as a glorified puppet, and we started to give Bob um, there's a lot of work by this uh, very famous computer scientist called Carl Sims, and he did a lot of work called Evolved Virtual Creatures, where he used a kind of reinforcement learning uh, way back, I think it was 90s, maybe late 80s, 90s, I think, um, to evolve a walking, uh, the way a baby learns to walk on its own, um, the way an animal learns to walk when it's born. Um, we decided to skip all that, because um, while it's a huge achievement, I, I thought we went down that road briefly, could Bob self-learn how to walk given its current body. And we started walking down that road and it became, well, it became the huge focus of this. So what, at the end of the day, we would have a AI that was only really good at walking. And we wanted, I wanted to really focus on this kind of decision-making and beliefs. So we decided um, very early on here to give Bob essentially a repertoire of very basic actions. Um, walking to a certain location, throwing things, grabbing things, holding things, looking at things, um, uh, going limp, um, pruning itself. So Bob was uh, essentially a kind of glorified puppet. Um, the end of all this, I'll just kind of fast forward a little, um, is that we had this puppet that uh, was going to be shown at the Serpentine, and there was about two and a half months to focus on the AI, which we had been in the past. And we were working on the AI with a, an external team, and this is a huge lesson in how to work. Uh, we were working with this outsourced AI company um, who had experience in this kind of creature-like AI, but from another era, from the 90s. And Maybe it was a generational thing, but it just didn't, we spent a lot of money on it and it just did not work out. And at the Serpentine, literally the week before the show was opening, this was the first iteration of Bob at Serpentine in 2008, in March 2018. Our, our lead engineer, he worked up a very impromptu but closer version to the AI thought that we would move toward, which I won't get into detail here, but Bob essentially had a very, very basic AI at Serpentine. And this haunted me, I felt like extremely fraudulent. Um, to be showing an AI that did not meet my own requirements of my own question, like how can we create an artificial creature that has sentience? There's no question about it. I did not think that the Bob we made at Serpentine had sentience, um, but it got us essentially past this first marker of knowing that that was the deeper question that we needed to really focus on, but at least we had a puppet here to work on. So I want to talk briefly about the AI. Um, How should I say this? Um, became very interested in this uh, computer scientist called Richard Evans. He's at DeepMind now. And he, 
He, he, he is very interested in Immanuel Kant, and he basically took Kant as a playbook for how to implement a new kind of cognitive architecture. And I, he has this paper, uh, it's called um, Learning Explanatory Rules from Noisy Data. And to me, this was like the lodestone. This was like totally the key. Because I think the landscape of AI that you hear about and you read about right now, pragmatically, not to mention AGI, but just AI, is essentially deep learning, which is essentially a kind of statistical pattern recognition. The problem with pattern recognition and this kind of deep learning is that um, it's very domain specific. So you, you train um, a neural network to play chess. You train a neural network to recognize stop signs for a self-driving car. But that's all it can do. But we know that intuitively intelligence is generalizable. You learn something in one game and you can apply it to another game entirely. You can abstract it. And this is what Richard Evans did, essentially. He, found, he figured out a way to essentially extract rules or miniature programs from the sensory input that you're receiving, from, that the computer's receiving. Um, and those rules could then be reapplied to another domain. And another way of saying this, maybe more colloquially, is it's a belief. Uh, an experience that you have produces a belief, and that belief bears upon a new domain that you can then infer or make a guess or make a first impression, however biased it is, in a completely new st with completely new stimuli. And so this was the starting point. And just to be brief, um, we, we implemented that paper for Bob. And um, that was half the equation. So essentially, this was our map for, for Bob. Um, the Richard Evans implementation is what I call the inference engine, and that's where we got to a place where we could feed this thing sensory input. It would develop a miniature logic program, which is a formalization of a belief. And then when you presented a new, like, new stimuli, let's say you present a red apple, and it makes some rule about what that might mean. Um, you present it with an orange apple, an orange sphere. It knows something about the red apple, its roundness, maybe its proximity to warmer colors, that it can now infer some other uh, qualities of this orange sphere. And you can imagine these rules ingesting each other, being recursive, so one rule could be used for the creation of increasingly complex rules of which one rule is a subset of. And so this was half the equation. So we had beliefs, but then how do we take a belief and make it meaningful? How do we take a belief and put it into action? And this came from um, a lot of reading to do with Carl Jung, who he hypothesized, and I think I feel it's true, he hypothesized that we are driven as a kind of uh, function of sub-personalities within us, that we're not just one unified person, and that to think of yourself as one unified person will make you crazy because you're not. In fact, we are a collection of sub-personalities or demons. And those demons, you have he hypothesized you have very basic ones that are almost inborn, kind of limbic demons or innate demons. Um, and you had, uh, over the course of your life, um, demons that you generated or given to you by your parents um, or that you generated circumstantially. And another way to say demons is a kind of motivation. Uh, you can create a motivation or an aim and you work out the steps to reach that aim intuitively through action, not through thinking, but through action. And so, we created a thing called the Congress of Demons. Um, and the Congress of Demons is a uh, set of motivations um, that contain um, a perception, a, a limit of perception of what it cares about, what it thinks is a, a tool, what it thinks is an obstacle, and everything else that's irrelevant. And it contains a miniature story, so the set of steps it takes to get somewhere. So if the eater demon, its story is it wants a spot of food. If it spots a food, then it moves towards it, holds it, picks it up, puts it in his mouth, and judges that it was uh, know, not poisonous and um, feels more energized. And that story, the key interaction between this beliefs and these demons is that um, often these demons, in the, in the case of Bob, would become surprised because what would happen is Bob would pick up an object and think it's food based on a previous inference, like a, a round red object. Put it in its mouth and it's a round brick you know, by my own design. And Bob would then, you know, feel pain in its teeth. And that difference between what it expected it would do, its action, and that action resulting in something unexpected, what we call surprise or shock, that difference, that emotional difference, 
would be the trigger to have it update its own beliefs. And this got me to a very um, interesting realization about what emotion could mean in a very basic and functional level. Emotion, essentially, in the case of Bob, is the signal for being upset. Of, it's, a, it's the barometer for how upset or not upset you are in terms of your expectations. And it is emotion that would signal into the brain how to, when and how to uh, update its beliefs. Um, so Bob, by virtue of this cognitive architecture, seeks to not be upset most of the time. But however, we want to introduce Bob, and we do introduce Bob, a constant source of new stimuli. And Bob is forming an initial impression at each stage and often being wrong. But the more wrong Bob is, the more it updates its beliefs and the less wrong it will be in the future, so it hopes. And so Bob, I would say, is this attempt to try to minimize upset in its life. And I thought, back to this question of sentience, maybe one sign of sentience is when you see a creature that can get upset and then try to deal with it. I think for me that became a very minimal definition of what sentience might mean. Um, not sure what my time is here. How much time do we have? Should I keep going? Okay. Um, oh, okay, so we should talk about this. So Bob is constantly getting upset, constantly making new beliefs, but the problem with Bob getting upset and making new beliefs from it is that Bob can easily get into a hole where it encounters, for example, a, I don't know, a bomb, like, early in its life. And that forms a fundamental belief about the danger of a bomb that's shaped with spikes and has like kind of gray tone to it. It might be so fundamental a belief that Bob will never revise that belief and build a whole personality based on that belief. How do we get Bob to not be stuck? And I realized, oh, it's parenting. Um, so we developed what, 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 I, what we call the Bob Shrine, which is a, an app, um, which um, essentially allows you to make offerings to Bob these different objects. You can change um, their parameters, but the most important thing is you can assert a parental caption on it. So you might send Bob a bomb, in this case, these bombs, but you might assert, um, I don't have a slide for this, I'm sorry. If you download the app, you can see, you can assert that the bomb is tasty, for example, it's like lying to your kid. And when Bob receives uh, this offering, it might know that the bomb from previous experiences is dangerous, but separate to the angel uh, demons, it has a whole copy of what we call angels. So it has a congress of demons and a congress of angels, which all compete for each other for taking action in Bob at any one given time. And um, if its angels is pre presenting a very compelling and emotional case for being the one to guide Bob in this moment, it might tempt itself and take the bomb that says bombs are tasty. Of course, that turns out to not be true, and it will uh, disbelieve that particular parent, in this case, this particular user shrine that you see at the top of, uh, that is present at the top area of Bob's enclosure. These are all app users, the most, uh, like the hundred most uh, uh, active app users. And when Bob touches them, they open up like a portal, dropping in the offerings of that person. Um, essentially, the parent, essentially, the viewer, the user is. Uh, Bob's collective parent, and Bob is essentially the, the village dragon. Uh, of course, that doesn't take away the agency of Bob. Bob has its own demons um, that have been producing and shaping its beliefs since it was born. So it's this kind of, um, how say, emergent mixture between nature and nurture. Um, I think just to end this briefly, this led me to the question of, is Bob actually sentient at the end of the day? Um, and I think, no, in the sense that um, Bob's beliefs are quite constrained thermodynamically. Literally, the computational limits of creating each of these beliefs uh, takes up a lot of memory, takes up a lot of time. In fact, we had to give Bob a sleeping demon just so it would do nothing and then process all the unprocessed uh, experiences to create new beliefs while it slept, which I guess is sort of what sleep feels like in real life. Um, and. Uh, but it did lead me to believe quite clearly that to the, 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 the prospect of creating an artificial sentience and perhaps an artificial general intelligence isn't so far away, that we keep thinking that maybe we have to replicate things at the level and substructure of neurons, but actually a kind of cognitive architecture to do with dealing with upset 
the unknown and metabolizing it into something that's known and doing that over and over again uh, to create better and better beliefs is quite within the range of possibility. Um, and just to close, I think maybe this led me to a very pragmatic definition of consciousness, which is perhaps the, the ability to confront upset uh, voluntarily when there's no urgency to do so. So Bob doesn't do that. Bob's con like an animal. Bob only confronts upset when it's upsetting. But like us, we can think about a belief, unpa undo it, make ourselves a little bit upset, and try to imagine or simulate a different course of action, a different belief. You know, we're not conscious most of the day. We're like brushing our teeth, we're not conscious. We're driving around, we're not conscious. It's only when we're upset that we become conscious. But of course, when we're thinking, you could say we're voluntarily conscious. I think maybe Bob led me to a deeper appreciation in a very pragmatic and doer way of what that might mean. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks. So thank you very much for this, uh, Ian. So mm -hmm. uh, this first we, we are starting the, the second part of the symposium where we will invite uh, Veronica Su and also uh, Lars Bang Larsen up to the stage. You can take a seat here, perhaps you in the, in the middle, Ian. Did you want to bring your computer? I think we'll just, we can just let it play. All right. Yeah. <coughs> thank you. <coughs> And I just leave the word over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Yeah, so Veronica and Bob, uh, Veronica and Ian, sorry. <laughs> what is <laughs> <laughs> Veronica and Ian, Bob's parents. I'm not welcome. that dumb, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we will be talking about the making of Bob sure. uh, that Ian, did, that you've talked about beautifully and that you have described as a virtual creature with a mind composed of many sub-agents, a congress of demons, uh, which is very evocative. And it, it feels very privileged to have the two of you here to uh, tilt the lid of the black box that is Bob and uh, letting us in on its making. So I'm grateful, we're grateful, uh, that you've both agreed to, to give us this look into uh, the relations of production of Bob, to put it with Marx, actually, mm -hmm. because even behind virtual creatures, even behind live simulations, there's human work, there's uh, material reality, there, there is a workshop, to put it like that. Mm -hmm. And um, the two of you are director and producer, respectively. Could you talk about you, uh, the, the distribution of labor between you? <laughs> well, Ian said, mm -hmm. He, he, he has a dream, and then he'll tell it <laughs> to me <laughs> the next day. And we set about immediately trying to figure out who can realize this dream. And then I think my responsibility as an artist is I have to convince you of that dream. <laughs> because I have, bad dr I have like terrible ideas all the time. <laughs> but that's part of the problem. I have terrible ideas all the time. And I can see you... Sometimes you're more kind than others, but uh, <laughs> I can see when it's not inter it's an idea that does not grip you or take hold. And for me, that's extremely important in our working relationship because, man, these projects are long and painful, and we, it has to be an idea that like grips us. Otherwise, it's it's sunk before it started. We use this analogy sometimes about the co-parenting thing, but like to to make a kid, you have to have the hard talk about whether you want one, <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, whether you want to like carry it around for like nine months, and in our case, like, two and a half years. And yep. um, it's that excitement, like, if Ian comes to me, it's like, I have this crazy idea, like, should we do it? And then, then the next step is, well, what would that feel like for someone? Is it enjoyable? Like, what are we trying to, what questions are we trying to answer? And Ian's very good at being compelling, and, um, but it's also, like, very centered around emotions and humans and how we should relate to something, and that's something I really respond to. Um, and the 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 cool part of my job is that it's not just about like me and Ian. It's about trying to find other people who are really committed um, at length to kind of make that happen too. So it's about finding these amazing like-minded people to come and work with Ian. Ian, I've, I'll, I'll stop calling you Bob now. Ian, you, you've, you've <laughs> written somewhere that the, the producer's responsibility is to be the energy keeper. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously pragmatic things about being a producer, but really it's this journey that we're taking and this journey with other people along the way. And I see, you know, the thing that Veronica um, 
I'm so good at is keeping the energy up. And it's not, it's not cheerleading because we go through dark moments and she'll tell people that this is a dark moment. Um, but <laughs> it's, it's to motivate and I think um, keep us on course because for myself as an artist, I can get so nerdy and detailed and deep into like the movement of Bob's arm or the look of its face or some inconsequential detail. I mean, I remember we had a, an argument about... <laughs> that stupid buffalo ox cow thing where I was like complaining to the 3D modeler about the lip and I was modeling it myself and it's 10 oh days God. and you just told me to give up the fucking <laughs> lip. Like it doesn't matter. And you're right. It didn't matter in the end. But I mean, that's yeah, why you were, it's important. You kept it the energy. It was sweet center. that you were trying to give Bob a friend. <laughs> and I yeah. was like, oh, maybe I am Buffy and you're Bob. And <laughs> like, maybe we should, he should, maybe it should have a friend and, and maybe it does matter what this ox looks like, but you know, we <clears throat> cut it in the end and it sucks. But I think it was yeah. the lip was, you know, the least of our problems. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and and recognizing that something is a, like, a red herring, is yeah. like, a hundred percent of the job. Like that's a distraction. That's not real. It's we're stressed out and we want to nerd out on a detail that it's not important. Yeah, so much of being an artist is procrastinating and not facing the real problem that you're dealing with because sometimes I don't even know the real problem and Veronica might have a better sense of it and we're both figuring out what the problem and the answer is along the way but I really procrastinate not knowing the problem sometimes and I think I think at a work where it has kind of this kind of complexity um, by design from the get-go um, it's impossible for me to do this like as a, as a sole artist I mean we have the classic idea of an artist who works by themselves uh, and does everything. But what ends up happening is um, the ambition of the project, the question of the project, and why it might be interesting to other people gets diminished and compromised. Some would say it gets distilled, which is true sometimes as well. But I think the nature of making something that involves AI, um, it's a team effort and it's uh, something that requires a new sort of model for how to be an artist um, in that you scale it so that you can work with the best people who are better than you. Um, so we really tried, we're working our way as in our working relationship to try to um, figure out what that is because there's no, I mean Hollywood has certain models for scaling production but they're at a way bigger scale and a way more coherent uh, end product than often what art is, in the, the endeavor of art is. Yeah. Yeah. So one basic difference between what the two of you do respectively is that you program and you, Veronica, do not. No. <laughs> but beyond the two of you, what, what kind of, you talked about team building and team efforts, what, what, kind, of, what kind of team is needed to pull off uh, a thing or a congress of demons such as Bob? And, 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 and how, do you, how do you build this team? I think it's about giving Ian options, bringing him, f I mean, I'm in the first, I'm the first line, like a, a filter where I have to I meet a bunch of people like I email a lot of people, talk to a lot of people, and then I have to make my own judgment about whether I should let this person meet Ian because I don't want to inundate him with all these candidates like that aren't personal. It's not a personality or creative or some. Sometimes things are just magic, um, whether it's not a fit or whether it is a fit, and um, that's like the first part of what I do is like I try and let. Ian interface and talk to these very seemingly technical people, but programmers are artists themselves and they have their own way of dealing and problem solving. So, hmm. but I would say the one of the first questions we ask each other is, what's their personality type? And <laughs> Ben introduces to it, what's their astrology sign? <laughs> that yeah. honestly, I mean, I know it sounds like some pseudoscience, but I'm telling you, it works. It's like filters <laughs> out so much. I will tell oh everyone God. that. Uh, People say, well, wh well, why you? You know, like, you're not a programmer. You studied fashion journalism. Like, what Like what makes you you and Ian? And it's my ENFP, Myers-Briggs personality yeah. type that he recognized, actually. Yeah. And was like, I really kind of need that person. Well, I liked you first, and then... Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a yeah. you know, it's a there's, yeah. a, there's a slight system. Yeah, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's a, re yeah. 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 Um, Ian, you talk very inspiringly about sentience and upset. Um, and 
stress and being stressed is always symptomatic of of us embodied beings and mm. of of yeah, we human subjects as interpretive structures. Um, you've also said in an interview. I'm going to quote you several times here, you <laughs> but you said in an interview, which, which uh, I found interesting, I'm convinced that imagining something and exercising the stressful states of bringing it into reality will become the new baseline of human activity. It will become the most human thing to do as other kinds of work become automated. Um, I was wondering, could I ask you to share some of the most stressful moments of bringing Bob into being? Well, um, uh, Serpentine 2018, because uh, I mean that with like tremendous gratitude and uh, for the experience of doing Serpentine. The show I was quite happy with, um, but this moment at Serpentine was the first showing of Bob and man, like we had a tall order to fill before, you know, we made this promise that we're gonna show the public a, like a sentient creature. And we were just, we just got the body working, you know, like, and we had had AI development going in parallel, but it was a, honestly, I think it was a procrastination thing where I did not want to think about how difficult it was to develop the AI that we really needed to answer this question honestly about sentience. And so we outsourced it, and it was a disaster. It was a total disaster. Um, cost us a lot of money, and we pulled the plug on that team the day I was flying to London to install the Serpentine show with my Sam, who's like our Weapon X brilliant engineer. He was on the call when we were pulling the plug on that, and he was like, I think I can do a better job than them on the plane. <laughs> and so he worked out not the AI that we see today, although he worked very he like, um, heavily on this as well, but he worked out an AI that approximated something closer to what we were uh, trying to achieve at Serpentine. And that, was, um, that was probably the biggest, uh, most stressful disaster. Yeah. Do, do you have a good one as well? <laughs> I mean, I have to say that, like, yeah, that, is, that was the most stressful week, but because we sort of felt exhilarated by this improvisational fix Sometimes there's an, ad I think about it as a very fond memory, actually. Okay. Um, no, I mean, not, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like the fact that we had Sam, the fact that we yeah. thought that Sam needed to be there and convince Serpentine to bring him out, live with us for a week, and we had late night napkin drawing, tr like trying to figure out how we could get close to even what Ian would even, you know, not like we can't open, like this can't happen. Uh, the fact that he was there and that's, he, he and Ian are synced up enough that he can understand and empathize as, as a producer is a win. Hmm. Yeah, like a general, you know, like no, not talk about war, but it's like having your best general be able to s sketch out a strategy for you because things are looking really bad. It's great. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <So> Ben. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so Bob is is programmed on a game platform mm. essentially. I was wondering how uh, how have the concept of interaction and social practices of uh, digitalized interaction informed Bob? Sorry, how do you mean? Uh, how, uh, g gaming and interaction. Yeah. How has that informed Bob? Um. Um, yeah, I mean, from the get-go, I thought the way to get Bob to be stimulated by unknowns is to introduce the viewer uh, into some dimension of uh, what Bob experiences. And at the Serpentine, we were uh, we tried to do a very direct relationship where you almost um, you could possess a part of Bob's body, and Bob would treat that possession as a entity different from itself, and would play with it, would bite it off, would um, uh, covet it. Um, and this was a whole iPhone interaction. And then later, in the second iteration of Bob that we did the su subsequent year, um, we decided to do more this indirect way of parenting, which mm -hmm. felt more, um, we learned, was uh, um, much more beneficial and to the point about what we're trying to achieve with Bob's AI. So the user now is essentially mm -hmm. interacting as an indirect parent uh, to Bob. 
And letting everyone on the fun at the same time is great. Like, I love it when a few people are standing in front of the Bob screen with their Bob Shrine app open. Um, whereas, like, you know, before it was just you have to have the hardware, like a stick to kind of manipulate. So yeah. it kind of made it kind of more open. And we felt very strongly about this architecture of uh, people's shrines appearing. And um, I don't know, there was this feeling of when, like, someone, like a B celebrity on Twitter, like, retweets you or reaches out to you, there's this, I don't know, there's this, like, oh, the demi has touched you. And <laughs> I wanted something of that feeling with the Bob Shrine in a way, because, you know, it's a virtual creature, it's not a fictional creature, it's a little, I don't know, what, snake worm thing. <laughs> it's like, it has such low status in the minds yeah. of someone coming to this for the first time. And often we think of AI is a very low status thing. You know, like Siri is like a kind of concierge. I mean, we're afraid of high status AI like the Terminator that might kill us. And I just thought there's something in between where maybe it has some status in relation to you um, that is respectable and that you would actually want, you would find a little hit of dopamine or pleasure when you got your shrine picked, that you were maybe a preferable parent to Bob. And so there was that dimension too that we wanted to sort of uh, experiment with. Social medium. Effect. Yeah, and then yeah. and then bragging to everybody else about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah people have Bob scores on their shrines, so like Bob yeah. rates you actually. Like it's like an Uber <laughs> driver. <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now, Bob's lifespan is infinite, and mine isn't. Um, so even if Bob is a congress of demons, it is immortal. Uh, so to speak, and this feels like a, like a quite fundamental power relation that Bob dominates over me. Um, and similarly, Ian, you've talked, you, you've given a great definition of new technology. You said that a new technology is only as valuable as its ability to assault human dignities. It's a very good one. A new technology is only as valuable as its ability to assault human dignities. Um, is Bob an assault on human dignity? Jeez, oh, I said that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that must have been an angry interview. Um, I guess what I meant by that is that it, uh, well, hopefully with the, all the artworks I really love have a sense of aliveness to it, and the reason why it has aliveness, whether it's actual animal, like, or it's a virtual creature, or a, a feeling of aliveness, is that the questions being asked are alive, meaning they're questions that might challenge something of your belief, something of how you d one does things, and in that way, it's assaulting, it's upsetting. Um, um, but just to say about Bob being immortal, Bob actually dies quite a bit because <laughs> it believes something okay. to be uh, beneficial to it, like, um, but it turns out to be like a poisonous fruit or something, and Bob dies. Um, when Bob dies in this kind of simulation, it roughly 80% of its uh, beliefs um, that it's been saving, mm -hmm. Uh, get wiped out, All right. and it resurrects itself. Sometimes, I don't know if you've seen the gallery, it kind of it's a cloud of red smoke. Yeah. It resurrects itself, and it has roughly 20% of its beliefs intact, and that's what it uses to make do with its birth state, its new rebirth state. And it's, of course, a little bit confused, but it has a little bit something to go on. Um, and um, we actually, you can... You can, Bob actually, you can track how many times it's died and been resurrected. And I'd like to think that the qualities that emerge across many, many lifetimes of Bob are essentially the equivalent of Bob's spirit, right? Like a spirit is a quality that's in a person but then reappears in another person and then another person. And it's the uh, continuity of that one characteristic that we call a kind of spirit. I mean, often we put an image to it or a character to it. But I'd like to think that part of making Bob a living creature that actually dies but then gets resurrected is over time, as an artwork, you start to see um, what is coherent and constant across all lifetimes of Bob. Um, maybe some Bobs are uh, extremely grumpy and uh, picky about food, and maybe others are very sleepy and don't like to do X, Y, and Z. But often I find that there's some quality of uh, uh, the things that it tends to prefer persist across time, and in a way, as stupid as that might be, that's the spirit of Bob. And I really wanted to think about this spirit. I mean, after all, Bob's form was like sort of influenced by this, these Tibetan Buddhist ideas and imagery, so I was thinking a lot about Bob's death, but how a spirit could emerge from it. Yeah. You think Bob's got a lot of dignity? 
Doesn't enough dignity to make people really care about what's going on with Bob. Why doesn't Bob like this thing I gave it? Does it hurt Bob? And feel sorry for Bob, feel joy for Bob. I think those are all really great successes. <laughs> yeah, w- w- what's the museum going to do when the show closes? Yeah. Does Bob die? Always. <laughs> Constant yeah, questions we'll and concerns talk. about Bob, but not for us. Yeah, like, yeah. no your, one cares what we're doing. It's your problem now. Okay, yeah, yeah, your problem. True. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's my baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Collections problem. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah on, on that note, I, I've, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Bob is the first life form of any kind to enter the collection of the Moderna Museum. Nice. Um, and, but it's, it's, uh, Moderna is not the first museum to, uh, to, to include, uh, to acquire... Bob for for his collection. Uh, how do art institutions respond to Bob um, when including the work in their collections? How, uh, do they know how to be good foster parents to Bob? You know, I mean, the few conversations, <laughs> the, no. the, the conservation questions I've had. I mean, some of them have uh, actually quite. A f- some of them have been well, like, is our Bob better than that other? <laughs> 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 Um, yeah. And I think there's a meta show to yeah, be had of, of that, Bob I, battles. I, I wanted to hold back on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was tempted to ask it. Well, there'll be a meta <laughs> show where Bob's battle each other. Uh, gonna, yeah. <laughs> Moderna Museum versus I don't know the, the, the yeah. Whitney's Bob. It all comes yeah. back to like Pokemon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, really but also like it's 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 kind of an interesting thing to say. You, the institutions that own Bob are like the fellowship of the Bobs. You guys really <laughs> should get together sometime and talk about what you plan to do as good parents of Bob and let yeah, us that's, know. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good advice. That's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another Congress of Demons. Another Congress, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in what ways uh, has uh, Bob's behavior surprised you as the makers of, of Bob? I'll let you answer. I just think that Bob surprises everybody and I think um, one thing that Ian's constantly seeking I, that I see in, make, in the making of his art is um, for the work to surprise him. And I think that is, that is the point, to kind of get something new out of some, all, the, all the rules, all the machinations that we set up, all the, all, the, all the ideas that go into it spit out something interesting that's new and strange. It's, it's life surprises us. I mean, one time at Serpentine, actually, I think, Ben, this was your story, where you, wa- you walked into the gallery one day, and w- there's several bobs in that show. Um, and one of the bobs is just reduced to a stub. Like, imagine, like, a snake that just got cut off, and it was just its head. And it was being fed food, but it kept not growing and avoiding food. And um, you couldn't help but feel, like, sorry for it, because... You like you wanted to, but then Ben was like, oh, "I feel so bad for this," and then like maybe it's it's choosing to be that way. So that was surprising. And then also, just the very beginnings of Bob's life. Like if we were to reset this simulation at the show and start it again, uh, what's quite beautiful is you start to see Bob's initial beliefs come into action. So for example, it um, goes after a particular like fruit and it's poisonous, and then because that's such a fundamental early belief of Bob's childhood, um, when Bob someone dumps on their shrine a bunch of those kinds of fruits, you see Bob immediately move away from it, and sometimes if he gets close to it, he'll pick it up and throw it really quickly away from it. And just to see that, that, psych, that really brief cycle of learning, it's, like, it's incredibly pleasurable. Yeah. Yeah. Different from any other Bob, too. Yeah. Yeah. It, during production, we ran into a lot of like, interesting bugs and glitches. I mean, sometimes you'd one of the days we were installing Bob at the Serpentine, we came in and there was like a Bob infestation um, where all the Bobs had just like grown out of control. Mm. Yeah, they like were like, there was so much food. Like. Yeah, like a kudzu <laughs> weed. So yeah. much so that it couldn't even move around in its enclosure. <laughs> it was like a like scary looking, like yeah. hor- horrific scene. And then yeah. there was one that escaped. We didn't know where it went. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, we can't, this can't happen. Wow. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, it was chasing some piece of food off to infinity or something. So, so, yeah. so, so there's a Bob on the loose out there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. On some infinity abstract horizon. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was I was wondering uh, how, how do you how do you manage entropy um, 
in in Bob as as, as a digital organism, because entropy. I mean, there, there would be hmm. entropy and uncertainty. I mean, there there would be no life as we humans would recognize it without entropy and uncertainty. But if entropy gets to dominate, it would terminate the life of the organism. How how do how do you work with and 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 balance these uh, contradictions of life? Yeah, I think this is really down to this Congress of Demons, which are, again, this sort of embodiment of motivations, and that's what gives Bob a, a, uh, a vehicle or a kind of a, a method to counter entropy. And Bob's idea of entropy is the more unknown that it's perceiving at any given moment, the more entropic the world seems to Bob, the more chaotic, the more stressful it is. And Bob, as I was saying before, is trying to minimize this sort of upset. So. Often, if you dump Bob in a completely new environment or you dump a bunch of new objects in it, it's constantly scanning, making first impressions, and then it starts to organize, like throws things that it doesn't like, covets things that it does like. And so you immediately see this ordering quality of its motivations. Yeah. And so I think that's true of us too. Like our motivations are ways of ordering what we value at any given moment um, without a sense of motivation toward anything. Like we wouldn't have an interpretive structure to appreciate a chaos yeah. in a way. Yeah. What's not right yet, you know? And you, your motivation wants to set it into something that's aligned. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So in the, um, I mean, just now you showed us drawings of Bob, and also in the uh, in the advertising campaign for the Mod Muses exhibition here in Stockholm, we, we used some of your hand drawings and cartoons uh, that you did as, as preparatory work for for Bob. So I was wondering, as, as really sort of, I mean, uh, it's sort of the art historian's question, I guess, what role does drawing have <laughs> in the cognitive architecture of, uh, of, of Bob? And it's, it's also, I'm also asking because it's, uh, drawing is, is something that, um, um, that connects the different contributions uh, uh, in, in, in the Mod Muses exhibition. I mean, the different contributions go in, in many directions, obviously, but, but drawing is, is, uh, is, a, is, a common, is a common denominator, sort of common methodology among the artists. Um, yeah, it's, so it's a way, so of, it's a way of thinking. Yeah, it's the quickest way of thinking sometimes, yeah. especially with our team. Like, we're using drawing. I mean, we have to draw in order to communicate some of these quite complex and incorrect ideas that we have about how things should be, how the cognitive architecture should go, what Bob should look like, how do you 3D model this and from all angles. And so it's like drawing is the only way to communicate like with any fluidity and speed. So it's really quite pragmatic. But is it, is it also a way of empathizing? In what sense? With, oh, something that, I mean, th there is something reflexive about drawing, right? <laughs> it's, uh, you. Uh, the the sort of the the pencil is a very you know basic extension of 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 your hand and of your nervous system mm. as well and um, you you put something of yourself of your own sort of ideation or your own associations out there um, in order to yeah to 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 give it in a in a in a very simple sense a life of its own yeah um, it's a bit embarrassing. I mean, drawing for me is parallel to this other thing that I try to do every morning, which is called morning pages, which is this mm. writing technique, I guess, but it's really a therapeutic technique where you just empty your brain in the morning. I type it, but you can write it. And it's, what happens is you think of all your anxieties at first and you write that down, they're so stupid, but you only know they're stupid, they feel overwhelming, but you only know they're stupid once you write them down. And you write them down and suddenly, because you're still sort of coming from a dream state, you, those anxieties morph into solutions to problems or things that you were been thinking about or mulling over from the previous day or the previous week. And then drawing is somewhat a supplement of that. Mm -hmm. um, I would never in my life share morning pages to anyone in the world because it's so, I mean, it's just like brain yeah. dump embarrassing. But the drawings at least are veiled in, I don't know, they look like something, you, you don't know exactly its contents, yeah. you know what I mean? I might be drawing Bob, but it's really about, I don't know, something else. Yeah. 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 They're my favorite thing. They're so good and clear. And um, y you look in the face of Bob in your drawings, and you you just want to you want to know it. You know, you want to you see it. Yeah, that's true. There's there is a moment where sometimes you get a drawing that, however crappy it is, captures the spirit of what you want to make, 
in, like, I tried to identify that drawing, we tried to identify it together, and we covet it, because that's going to be the thing that we hold on to until the thing is actually real. Mm. And we really, we've like printed out a million times, we like, I stick it on my desktop phone, the phone of my wallpaper, I just need it to be real. So yeah, in that sense, drawing is this really like, I don't know, teleportation to the future that you cling to until it's possibly real. Yeah. Oh. We have like a making of book for emissaries, but we don't have one for Bob, but it would be really interesting because um, seeing the making of something really helps you appreciate like every thought, every every hint of it that was coming. So yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we got a little bit closer to the cognitive architecture of Bob and also what it could mean uh, by having a creature of uh, digital life that have sentience. Um, we would now continue by inviting a panel from the Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, two students, uh, Paula Vega and Claire Holm Schau. Please feel free to enter the stage and also Roberto Verganti, um, who will develop this discussion, one could say, but more um, from the point of uh, the perspective of the Stockholm School of Economics and the thoughts we have ongoing there. So perhaps I could at least start by leaving the word over to, uh, to Claire, well, or to Paula. We'll start with the first question. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, so my first question is about uh, how when I first saw the artwork, Bob, I felt... Um, I couldn't help but feeling what Bob is feeling, kind of like a pet or like a, a god because you give it offerings and then it responds to it. So um, what struck me was that it's quite human in how you interact with it because it um, comes, it behaves and it's very emotional uh, in ways that you also react to it with your emotions. So if you see, it, like you said, when ba Bob is sad, you also become sad mm -hmm. viewing him. And usually when we see or use AI, we think of it uh, as much more stationary and rational, um, that it has its own agenda or something. But with Bob, you don't really see that. So my question is, what is it that makes Bob feel more human? And what is it that incites these emotions in the viewers of Bob? Hmm. I think partly Bob is embodied in a creature. And often when we think of AI, we think of a system that is uh, embedded in, a, I don't know, like the behind the scenes of a website or like behind the scenes of an app. But because Bob has a representation of a body, and I think the way we present it at, um, at scale as well, Bob has a certain size and a relationship to you. And I think these seem like architectural or uh, exhibition details, but they really did matter in terms of making this uh, kind of cognitive bridge, this emotional bridge to a viewer. Okay, great. I have uh, another question <laughs> about uh, the emotionality behind Bob. And uh, that is when I see the artwork, I see a lot of the human emotions, like you showed the different expressions that Bob can take. And one of the emotions that I felt or that I saw through Bob was greed. Uh, greed. Yeah, greed. Okay, I, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you see he's very greedy, like yeah, yeah. especially with the context of the shrine where you offer him something and then sometimes he will uh, eat a lot or sometimes he will just self-destruct. Yeah. Um, something that I identified as a very greedy behavior. And this is something, as uh, business students, we talk a lot about greed, like uh, profit maximizing and such. Mm. And uh, this is something that we try to um, talk about and um, work against, specifically like through sustainability initiatives and such. So what I wanted to ask was, what do you think Bob tells us about human greed or... How does he react to this emotion? That behavior you're observing is, I think, the result of Bob simply doing more of what's working. And I think, um, yeah, it's, it comes down to Bob's beliefs about, let's say he keeps tapping this one shrine, he keeps dumping like a casino machine, like all this like, good stuff. It, its belief is just reinforced that not only does it, the thing that's coming out of it is it's good, but that if it keeps tapping this thing, it will 
continue to produce more good. And so, I mean, Bob has no countermeasure to that unless someone introduces independently on their own shrine something similar to the object, which is completely, I don't know, malevolent or toxic or something. And Bob, in its greed, has a taste of that and, you know, is put off. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, one, it's, Depending on Bob's age and how many other beliefs it has, it's holding, um, it might not be enough to offset Bob's greed with just one example. Um, depends on Bob's age, so maybe that's a connection to human beings. Depends on at what age the behavior is um, proven to be working really well. If it's a very young Bob and then it's presented with a counter um, experience, it will more likely undo that belief. But if it's a very old Bob, man, it'll just keep doing what it's doing despite any number of countervailing beliefs, because it's actually more painful for Bob emotionally. This thing I was saying about upset and the expectations being upset, it's more painfully, uh, it's more emotionally painful for Bob to undo a belief, because it's not only does it feel more upset in doing so, it has to use more energy cognitively to produce a new belief that still makes its reality of all the things it's known and experienced coherent. So to undo a belief is like a really serious thing for someone to have to do, and most people don't want to do it. Um, so if someone has certain beliefs that inf enforce a behavior that looks greedy, it's probably, partly it's because, you know, it's worked and it's predicated on a lot of beliefs that also work for that person. I think also, like, bringing Bob around the world, Bob experiencing a lot of different kinds of parents is a very useful thing. Because I think people around the world have different beliefs. And if Bob experiences some people in Japan who are very polite and honest and whatever, or maybe they're very, you know, sneaky, and, and they're like, oh, well, I'm used to honest, but then I'm also used to sneaky, and then they go somewhere else where it's like, I don't know, America, where you just, you know, like, oh, let's either feed it a lot of food and yeah. just let it guzzle itself. Um, are you calling Japanese people sneaky? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, but just you know, it's it's a we we talked about this idea of like sending Bob to boarding school and yeah. you know, like uh, <laughs> yeah, living in J Japan right for three now. months and then going to New York is like a very different kind of education. It's true. So I think having Bob experience a lot of different people is is a kind of parenting. <laughs> and I'm just thinking about this like self-reflecting process that Bob has and you know confronting his beliefs which is very important for his learning but also for him to grow and we think about maybe like organizational theory it's very important to you know learn about human interaction and human behavior but also like having this self-reflective process of how do you learn about yourself and so on so I was thinking in Bob you see that there's this outer learning when he you know, receives the shrines, but he's also l constantly learning about himself from the demons and so on. So I was just thinking, how did you manage to balance this this dual aspect of like the inner and outer learning? And also, what would you say that we can learn about like Bob's own learning process? And if you like, I see there's kind of like a hint of mindfulness in him. So maybe we can like talk talk about that if you feel. But say again the question of the. Like, partner. how can we feel, like, learn from Bob's learning process? And also, how did you manage to balance the dual aspect of the outer learning from, you know, the environment and the audience, but also the inner learning? Yeah, yeah. Bob. Let me think about it. it strikes... Hmm. Well, I just had a baby, um, like, five months ago, and this was after all the Bob stuff was finished. And what struck me as really resonant and made me really scared about having a kid is that with Bob, it was so clear to me the very early experiences that Bob had that first instilled, um, that first allowed it to generate certain beliefs and those beliefs get reinforced, that those first, in the case of Bob, those first few weeks were like so critical to its emergent personality over the course of its lifetime and its ability to adapt to um, uh, the degree to which it was able to adapt to like change. And when I think about my own daughter, like she's five months old, and I, from the literature I've read, like the age of zero to five, like super critical for a kid and how they, maybe their personality is partly in them, but how they manifest that personality and how they trust or do not trust the world is manifest in that age as well. And so I feel uh, there's definitely some, for me, a very emotional parallel. Um, 
children really, Bob as a child, but also my kids, like, this is like the divine potential and it's like, not downhill from there, it's just more specific from there. And so that potential becomes manifested into something more specific and that's a beautiful thing too. But to, I don't know, not to protect the potential, but to give it the right food or something in the beginning, it's like, I felt that in making Bob and I really feel that now. When Bob started, when, we, when Ian started making Bob, he had just gotten a dog. I just want to throw it out there. And, the, yeah. and, and Mars, his dog, really, really inspired Ian. I felt you would come in with like, oh, Mars just learned this thing. Mars has this new behavior. It's inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> it, it felt like this kind of, I don't know, like iPhone upgrade every week where it would learn new <laughs> things. And we'd send it to a trainer one week and it came back with all these new apps in its brain. And it would do, <laughs> You know, so yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I was quite intrigued by the relationship be, between you and Bob. Uh, as uh, I mean, when we look at Bob and we look up there, there are the parents, you know, parenting the shrines. But so in that world, there are the parents, but more or less you're kind of God. So you're being designed in the world and, and designing the rules and. And as always with God and his creators, because you design creators, you know, sometimes the creators escape the control of God. I mean, you, you, you design some rules there, but then creators have their own life mm -hmm. and the freedom of thought. And sometimes they do something disappointing to the God, to the point that God tried to have the range. So did you ever hate uh, Bob? Did he do something that was you know, out of the rules of the game and, and you were very disappointed? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah, all those videos I was showing you, these are just Bob, like, this is the best of Bob. <laughs> like, you don't know how many other videos we recorded of just what bad. What the hell is he doing there? You know, what? Well, that's not the what it's designed for. <laughs> all the time, uh, I mean, I, you know. We call them bugs in the tech world. <laughs> they're bugs, but there may or may not be a god, but if there was a being present to watch evolution, man, they would just watching chaos, it's total hell. So because if you are an artist and you, you can laugh about it, but there are a lot of managers, you know, we teach in business school, that if you, you design an organization like God, you know, and, and suddenly someone is doing something stupid, what the hell is it doing there? So yeah. We should learn from that kind of attitude and say, oh, okay, that's well, there, it. <laughs> there are a lot of surprising side cases and things we never thought about that we should make sure that Bob doesn't do. So it's about identifying all the potential issues in advance. I mean, I know nothing about business, but, but just, I'm just thinking about that question just because it bears upon uh, the beliefs of a person, the way I was thinking about the beliefs of Bob and like your manager and you design this system about how to manage people and you have people misbehaving within that system. And so it's a question, I think if I'm understanding your question, it's either the system needs adjustment, but then oftentimes maybe the person is um, maybe you need to fire them <laughs> in, in the sense that um, uh, my understanding from gained from Bob and also now as a parent is that like what someone brings to bear upon a job is like they bring themselves and their talent but man they bring their entire baggage and history too and if that's not aligned in enough ways with the institution like it's bad for both sides that's my experience working in a team. We've had you know, people who just didn't work out and they brought to bear on the project some amazing talent, but baggage that was incompatible with just the basic ways in which the team had to function, so. I mean, we're very intimate with our team. We know what they're going through. We know what they're working on. And a lot of the people we work with, I mean, Ian, Ian and I are the only people sitting in a like, virtual studio all the time. Everybody else has their own life. Everybody else has their own projects and their own desires. And so we really have to trust that those people are aligned with our goals and that they're bringing something very specific that we need. That's like kind of how we work. Um, so we're, we don't have the luxury of sitting in an office and being with them everybody every day and um, having to experience uh, any kind of the baggage every day, but it yeah. does manifest itself towards the deadlines. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. 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 And then, then I mean, continuing on this thing of God and, and controlling things, which is the, the metaphor of, uh, it's not only management, all humanity, you always have the problem of controlling the world around you. So, so mm -hmm. in this case, 
Bob escapes you as an artist, and also I think also artist seeks for perfection, and, and, and then mm -hmm. something doesn't go the way. But I was intrigued by the end of your presentation. Then you see I learned a lot during the, the making of of Bob, and and uh, I wonder if you're still learning now. I mean, it's interesting because you're not only creating a, a creator, mm -hmm. you're uh, you've been creating a learning creature, which mm. is kind of your question about being a sentient being. It's being, you know, if you're learning, then then you're a sentient being, which for a teacher is fantastic. So it's really mm. learning is the core of, of a being. Mm. Uh, are you still instead now learning from Bob? Which means in reality, you design Bob as a learning creature and now Bob is designing you as a learning creature. So is Bob designing you? Are you learning from him? Um, I mean, I'm eager all the time for Bob to surprise me because I think if Bob can surprise me still, that means it itself is, I don't know, encountering more of what it doesn't know and trying to you know, overcome that. Um, when Bob becomes too predictable, I see it as a sign of failure in a way. So, I mean, what's happening to your bags of beliefs now that you see? You have your bags of beliefs, your, your congress of demons. Are you talking about me yeah, personally? Yeah, yeah. Are you learning from, from, from him? There is something new happening in your Congress of Demons there that you didn't was there before you designed. Um, I think the design that we ended up putting into the cognitive architecture of Bob, I feel more and more is truthful, actually. Um, that we are composed of sub-personalities, that we do filter our perception very heavily based on our motivations, and that early beliefs are hard to change. I don't know, maybe I doubled down on the thing that I made. Maybe that's the way it influenced me. Yeah. Oh. I think Ian is eager to explore like what, could, like in a, in a bigger sense, like what a Bob AI could do one day. I think he's learning in that way, whereas he's inspired um, by what evolving a bag of beliefs could do in the future. Yeah, that's true. So just to say, Bob is a central character in this next work we're making, which is a cartoon series called Life After Bob. And it's, a, um, it's about a world in which the characters, the human characters, have a fourth ego state in a way, another demon in their mind. It's an artificial demon, and it's called Bob. And it um, functions almost like as an internal coach, or con like a Jiminy Cricket, like a conscience, but also a coach, and then also can take over the character's nervous system and do things for them that they find tedious, like walking up a flight of stairs. It's like, Bob, just walk for me. And then the person's mind is free to go off into this, create this kind of neural internet, like um, fantasy of a neural internet. Um, so Bob in this way has inspired quite a bit of other unrealizable thoughts right now, but that can be realized in a form of a fiction. Okay, so thank you very thank much. You. So if you have any questions from the audience, uh, we invite them right now. Yes? Um, hey, uh, thank you for the presentation. Super interesting. Um, so, if I understand Bob's world correctly, he um, like his sustenance is these offerings that the users give him through the shrines. Mm -hmm. So, if the users would stop giving him offerings, so there would be no more users, he would essentially die. Sure. But does he like realize this? Does he have a strategy to find more new users? Does he have like a trigger that, okay, it's below like 10 users, now I'm going to put up an ad on App Store or something like that? <laughs> um, yeah, man, that's a Bob 3.0 question. Yeah, <laughs> for sure that would be cool to see. And it's within the general cognitive architecture that we developed that were we to deprive Bob of users, Bob might develop some pattern of behavior that if rewarded, would generate more users, could, that might be possible, yeah. It's within, yeah, that's possible. We just haven't done it yet, it's a good idea. Are you a business student? <laughs> nope. No. <laughs> we, um, Ian, I don't know if you wanna talk about this, but you know, in the process, we definitely toyed with the idea of giving Bob money. Uh, there's a whole like blockchain 
development f- fork of Bob that we did not end up going down. But yeah, there was going to be a Bob currency. <laughs> People could, I don't even know. We had so many ideas about what that could be. But We yeah, asked ourselves imagine. tons of questions like, what would Bob buy? Yeah, because we want to imagine... <laughs> You know, money's a funny thing because money makes things really real. Like, there's pain that makes things real and there's money that makes things real. And if Bob could spend money in some way, whoa, as a viewer, you would think, this thing is really real. It has some agency, right? Because it's spending money. Like, if Bob could, like, go on Amazon and send you 10 rolls of toilet paper, like, <laughs> you'd be, I'd be thrilling, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is a possible direction, too. Cool, thanks. Yeah. All right, we have another question up, uh, up here. Yes, uh, I'm Daniel Pargman from Royal Institute of Technology. So I'm a researcher there at the School of Computer Science and Communication. Uh, I don't work on AI, uh, but I I was really interested in complexity studies and artificial life in the 90s. You mentioned Carl Sims and stuff like that. Um, And they did amazing things back then with really simple rules um, you could have really visually appealing stuff happening on this screen, and it would be amazing still, you know, the virtual flock of birds mm-hmm. with just a few simple rules replicated in a hundred virtual birds, and they actually looked like birds. It's hard not to see birds, even though it was just really simple rules. But this is, of course, a lot more complex with a, demon, a, a congress of demons. But my question is, so... On the one hand, we have the richness of the visual representation, which is what draws us in. And you mentioned the serpentine, and you didn't seem to be very happy about this, like Bob 0.5 version, but it looked great, I think, to me. Mm. It looked really visually appealing. And now you have a more advanced Bob, and it's really it's not so easy to see uh, the difference for me as a viewer. But now that you tell us about it, we know that Bob has... Um, beliefs, and he's upset, and there's parenting and sleep going on, but but it's hard to see that, or it might be hard to see that. So my question is, has to do with sort of like the balance or the relationship, rather, between the richness of the visual representation and the sort of richness or the niftiness of the AI. Because you could spend a lot of work on having a symphony orchestra or a parliament of demons, and, and we wouldn't get it, or we wouldn't see a difference. Uh, and you can also have really appealing behaviors happening on a screen with very simple rules. So how do you reason about that? And what is it that you're trying to accomplish and so on and so forth? Yeah, well, two comments about that. First of all, I should... I was very happy with the Serpentine insofar as I need to say the Serpentine, they are like... They were the risk taker for Bob. Like, they really helped spearhead it. They helped um, make it pos- the first iteration of Bob possible. And so, like, they took all the risk for Bob. The second thing I want to say is that, yeah, I agree. It's hard to see what's going on under the hood. And we're toying with the idea of showing Bob now with a diagnostic kind of view where you could see that. Um, Hmm. It's an interesting question. It's something that we've been trying to puzzle out ourselves. Um, Because you're right, flocking is kind of out procedural animation behaviors, very beautiful in themselves. I think for me, it's a selfish answer, which is that to make the journey of making Bob worthwhile, like we had to go down this hyper complex route and suss out what was true about this question of sentience and come to this new appreciation. I don't think I could give this talk to you guys now if I didn't make Bob in the way I did. It would be a very one-liner talk. I would give you a talk about the three rules of flocking or something like this, and we could watch it and it would be beautiful. And this would be a perfectly satisfying artistic experience, but I don't think it would bear upon the questions that I personally have as a person right now, and I would think that you guys have as audiences right now. There's some there's something that Ian says a lot to me is that, you know, he he always wanted Bob to be like an encounter at the zoo, like uh, an encounter with a porpoise or um, a reptile, uh, you know, it was it was always about kind of someone coming into this experience to in a one-one like where it's like you're encountering something alive, and I think that I mean for me it, it sounded like the decision to not show a diagnostic view was that it would have too much importance. It it would assert that it wasn't alive or wasn't 
quote unquote real. Um, and and in what in this presentation, it was kind of about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Just to follow that, that's an interesting point. Maybe it's to do with the maturity at which we are coming to an artwork. Um, and by that I mean, when I go to a zoo, the first thing I want to see is I just want to see the animal. I want to see him do something cute. I want to see him eat something. I want to see him sleep. Really boring stuff. And then, should my interest be still fulfilled by the animal, like if I'm interested in an animal, I would then want to understand like why is the spider walking this way? Why does the snake do this? Um, and I, those questions are. Um, a consequence of being portaled first by the experience, just the basic experience, the aesthetic experience, the sensory experience of being seduced by this creature, this animal. And um, I think maybe now might be the point in time where the exhibition of Bob opens up the doors a little bit about what's going on under the hood, because yeah, we're, we're quite proud of what's going on under the hood. Um, but maybe the earlier iterations and the way in the earlier presentations of Bob, um, sorry, that's, it's more important just to Meet Bob. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your work. It's uh, super inspiring. Um, I was wondering about the demons, really. That was um, really an interesting um, strategy. And I was thinking about uh, also, what you mentioned in the in the quote that Lars he, he he said about how the most human thing in the future might be to actually kind of create what you can imagine, and so that got me thinking about imagination and thinking about in your research if it's possible to somehow trans translate um, this theory of demons into also having some kind of dreams for the future, being motivated by, by, by values, by, by, by imagination, by wanting to be something. If Bob, if, if parents could install values, for example, or you sh Bob, you should you know, grow big, Bob, you should mm -hmm. be yellow, stuff like this. I mean, uh, we talk a lot about motivation and, and this kind of very simple form of, of motivation, you know, I like this, I enjoy this, this is good. But I, I was just thinking when it comes to people, for example, we seem to be very much motivated by, by what we want to be or what we can envision for ourselves or for our communities or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if, if you guys, if you touched upon that in your research, if you had conversations uh, in the studio about those kinds of motivations. Mm. Um, if, are you asking like personally or both? Yeah. Or just in a kind of. Um, I mean, as a parent now and thinking about Bob, again, the dream of Bob is that Bob keeps surprising me. And that would be a sign that Bob is both learning but also essentially independent in a way. In the way that we would hope a child or a person throughout their lifetime keeps surprising themselves and keeps surprising the people that know, who know them. Um, because it would be a sign that they're encountering something unknown and they're um, doing something differently. And then, uh, I'm not sure, quite sure how to answer that question other than I wouldn't never, as a parent of Bob, want to impose, Bob, you should be this, this, or this uh, in a very concrete way. I guess it would be like, if Bob were more intelligent, I had to say something to Bob, it'd be like, you know, I don't know, like pursue more of what grips you or interests you and that you care about. And that's probably a good plan. I don't know if that's uh, what you I mean. I mean, I imagine your kid is probably going to have a lot of the same values as you do. Just That's just kind of what happens no. uh, yeah, <laughs> in parenting. Uh, and I just, I was just thinking that it would be, when you talk about motivation, it's just interesting because we're motivated by so many things. I mm. mean, machines and, or this type of intelligence is motivated by this very simple form. And I was just thinking that people are often very much motivated also by, you know, Imagination, imagining what it would be, what they are like in the future, or, or kind of reaching towards goals, for example, being goal oriented, and, and yeah. So I was just wondering if you guys thought about that, but maybe not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I see what you're asking. Okay, so the limitation of Bob is this: when I said that Bob might not be very sentient, it's this. For us, and I think even for animals, they have immediate goals, but then they can imagine new motivations or craft new motivations that temporally exist on a longer time scale. 
maybe it's not even years. Maybe it's not the end of your life. Maybe it's like five minutes from now or next week. Like um, the difference between like a wolf and a human, right? Is like a wolf, if you present it with a bunch of meat, will just eat it all. It doesn't have an ulterior goal of like, oh, I'll save some of this meat for next week. Um, and so much of intelligence that I think intuitively know about um, when we think about intelligence is an alignment of goals. So the short-term goal is aligned with the medium-term goal is aligned with the long-term goal. And when those alignments come in, like you feel like you're doing something really meaningful. Like every action you take toward that alignment is like, whoa, you like know you're in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. But when something is cross-purposes, like maybe you do something now, like impulsively that feels good, but you know a year from now it's gonna like screw you over. Um, you might still do it, but you never feel as good as it should, right? Um, or you sacrifice something. You want to do something in the long term, and then you like take the sacrifice. To, like, like I stopped. I stopped trying to like get off sugar, right? It's so hard in the immediate term, but I thought maybe this would help certain health things in the long term. It is incredibly difficult. Um, Bob can't do that, and I think this is a real marker of intelligence to align and craft motivations that better align in time across multiple uh, time horizons. This is extremely intelligent, co like conscious behavior. And Bob definitely can't do that. That's a huge limitation. And through m machine learning, you can definitely be very prescriptive about what you want Bob to end up doing. But I don't think that's what you're interested yeah. in doing. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. So I think we have time for one concluding question. Do we have anyone? Oh, we have one here. All right. Two. Two? Two short ones. Um, hey, uh, I love the talk. So you mentioned Pokemon throughout uh, spe uh, throughout speaking as an inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, there's been over the last twenty years uh, lots of digital pet simulators, um, like Tamagotchi or like talking cat that my younger siblings have. Mm -hmm. Did you ever consider commercializing Bob or like putting it in an app, maybe adding some microtransactions, some ads? Um, like having it be like uh, something that escapes into the wider world beyond just the art uh, uh, environment. I'd love to. I would love to. Yeah. There have been so many Tamagotchi discussions. God. Man, like, yeah, that's a dream. Yeah, I would love to. It's just time, energy, and I guess doing it right. Um, yeah, I, I would love to. It's definitely something that we're thinking about a lot. Thanks. Why are you a game designer? <laughs> I noticed you've been recruiting. No, no, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a producer, so I'm like, huh. Ah. <laughs> it was just a thought. Thanks. One more. Yeah, we have one more there. Yes. Um, so, I mean, with Bob, as I've understood it, you're trying to explore what it means to be sentient. And then you're sort of looking maybe at, to yourself, like what does it mean that we're sentient and like other animals and creatures, well, like what makes them sentient? Uh, and like, then I thought it was really interesting when you mentioned the dog and like used this metaphor with like the dog being uh, a phone that came back with new apps and stuff. Uh, so sort of like, I mean, using technology as a metaphor for talking about how, say, a brain works. Mm. Uh, because with Bob, it really seems like you have this interplay where you're building technology off of like how a human brain works. And through that, you're exploring sentient and like what, do, what does it mean to be sentient and to be a human? Mm. So like... Uh, Bob is built on us, but we're also sort of like, in a way, built off of Bob, like learning from Bob what it means to be us. Like, in, in that way, the way that we sort of see ourselves as technology and use technology to understand ourselves, what do you think Bob might do for us? Or like, how we understand the world? Like, yeah, societal change, I suppose. Huh. I, I mean, in a basic way, this whole thing that I've been thinking about and been trying to, I guess, formalize by speaking about, about the Congress of Demons, a person composed of subpersonalities, um, its relationship to beliefs, emotion as a barometer for updating your beliefs. I think all of those things have 
learn from Bob and try to, uh, I don't know, I, I think about it a lot more right now, even with my own daughter. And I said this, my, my wife said this was fucked up to say, but I just said it to her like, I'm like, oh, parenting is programming. And she thought that was really sinister or something. But then it's like, well, parenting is programming, but you know, your kid programs you too. And it's a, it's a, it's a bi-directional relationship and programming doesn't, isn't a bad thing. In fact, it's probably necessary to some degree or inevitable. And I think these metaphors that we use that come from a more, I don't know, techno technologically literate landscape that we live in right now are, yeah, they have their trappings, but they're way more useful than metaphors to do with steam engines. So <laughs> I, like, I'll take them. You know, hardware and software, when I was making, when we were stressed out in the serpentine phase, just making the body, like I realized that was so important because we needed the hardware. I mean, hardware, the virtual hardware. Bob's body was Bob's hardware through which it could act and sense. Now it couldn't think, but it can act in sense, and we needed the body for that. And the shape and specificity of Bob's body would determine a large part how it would express and uh, deal with its own intelligence. So we needed the hardware first, and then we could create the software of its cognitive architecture. These metaphors are really useful, I think. Um, no. But do you like think they do something to the way we then act? I mean, for example, using the programming metaphor, does it... Does it in any way like change the way you do parenting then? I mean, if your wife was like, wow, that's sinister. Like, is your parenting <laughs> more sinister? I don't think Ian <laughs> programs me. Yeah. And we have a very close relationship, but it, it, it's, it's us reacting to each other. I mean, he doesn't try to program our team, but he might push for something and I'll be kind of programmed to kind of assert more of what he wants. So... It's yeah. it's hum it's very hum I mean it's it's there's magic in it if that's what you're saying is missing there is definitely a lot of human translation but yeah, yeah. Just about, I'm trying to understand your question I guess it's useful to be in a relationship with another person who tells you that metaphor's off <laughs> well, it's useful yeah okay I'm sorry I just have to ask this last question because we've been talking about Bob as a um, a self-contained bag of beliefs, in a way. Um, mm. And when this last question just made me think, in version 10.0, will the Congress of Demons also include other sentient beings or human beings? Like, could it be a um, like in the way that your relationship to each other and our relationships to all of each other are reciprocal? Mm. Uh, can we envision a kind of um, intelligence that would include empathy? Mm. I love that question. Mm. Ian came to me and said he wanted to become a, a super organism. When he, he first came to me as the artist who programmed everything himself, animated everything himself, one of the first things is like, I want to expand. I want to expand my practice. I want to expand my way of working and he used the word super organism and in a way a congress yeah I, I feel that's my job as to be one of his senators or whatever <laughs> <laughs> representatives <laughs> yeah um, I'm just trying to understand this question of empathy by, by empathy you mean uh, knowing how it feels outside of your own shoes yeah, is, that, is that right both. yeah Mm -hmm. But we as humans are motivated by also we yeah. want to cause others pain. Sure. I think this is a highly conscious activity, empathy. Because I don't actually think many animals have what we think of as empathy. Because when you have empathy, you know not only what makes another person feel good, but you also know what makes them feel pain. And that's you know, some say that's the root of all evil, right? When you know something causes someone pain and then you still do it or you do it out of design. Um, and I think a lot of animals don't have that. They cause pain in a direct way to like, you know, a wolf will bite something, but they're not causing pain to like, like mess with a, I don't know, another animal. And um, I think this is, an achieve this is an achievement of consciousness, empathy. Um, but also high degree of malevolence is also like deliberate evil is high, it's a highly conscious activity. And 
for better or worse, Bob's not capable of that yet. Yeah. We but don't the, really like to eat octopus anymore, <laughs> octopi anymore. That's changed. That's really true. We have high empathy for octopi. Yeah. <laughs> After Bob. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this fantastic uh, uh, discussion. Uh, thank you, uh, Claire and Paula Vega. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, uh, Lars. Thank you, Veronica. So, and thank you, Ian Cheng. It was great to have you, all of you guys here. Thanks. Thank you.